Tom's meeting with the prince. Tom got up hungry and sauntered hungry away, but he, with his thoughts, busy with the shadowy splendors of his night's dreams. He wandered here and there in the city, hardly noticing where he was going or what was happening around him. People jostled him and some gave him rough speech, but it was all lost on the musing boy. By and by he found himself at Temple Bar, the farthest from home he had ever traveled in that direction. He stopped and considered a moment, then fell into his imaginings again and passed on outside the walls of London. The Strand has ceased to be a country road then and regarded itself as a street, but by a strained construction, for though there was a tolerably compact row of houses on one side of it, there were only some scattered great buildings on the other, this being palaces of rich nobles, with ample and beautiful grounds stretching to the river, grounds that are now closely packed with green acres of brick and stone. Tom discovered Charing Village presently and rested himself at the beautiful cross built there by a bereaved king of earlier days, then idled down a quiet, lovely road past the great cardinal's stately palace toward a far more mighty and majestic palace beyond, Westminster. Tom stared in glad wonder at the vast pile of masonry, the wide-spreading wings, the frowning bastions and turrets, the huge stone getaway, with its gilded bars and its magnificent array of colossal granite lions and other signs and symbols of English royalty. Was the desire of his soul to be satisfied at last? Here, indeed, was a king's palace. Might he not hope to see a prince now, a prince of flesh and blood, if heaven were willing? At each side of the gilded gate stood a living statue, that is to say an erect and stately and motionless man-at-arms, clad from head to heel in shining steel armor. At a respectful distance were many country folk and people from the city waiting for any chance glimpse of royalty that might offer. Splendid carriages with splendid people in them and splendid servants outside were arriving and departing by several other noble gateways that pierced the royal enclosure. Poor little Tom, in his rags, approached and was moving slowly and timidly past the sentinels with a beating heart and a rising hope, when all at once he caught sight through the golden bars of a spectacle that almost made him shout for joy. Within was a comely boy, tanned and brown with sturdy outdoor sports and exercises, whose clothing was all of lovely silks and satins, shining with jewels. At his hip a little jeweled sword and dagger, dainty baskins on his feet, with red heels, and on his head a jaunty crimson cap, with drooping plumes fastened with a great sparkling gem. Several gorgeous gentlemen stood near, his servants without a doubt. Oh, he was a prince, a prince, a living prince, a real prince, without the shadow of a question, and the prayer of the pauper's boy's heart was answered at last. Tom's breath came quick and short with excitement, and his eyes grew big with wonder and delight. Everything gave way in his mind instantly to one desire, that was to get close to the prince and have a good, devouring look at him. Before he knew what he was about, he had his face against the gate bars. The next instant one of the soldiers snatched him rudely away and sent him spinning among the gaping crowd of country gogues and London idols. The soldier said, Mind thy manners, thou young beggar. The crowd jeered and laughed, but the young prince sprang to the gate with his face flushed and his eyes flashing with indignation and cried out, How dost thou use a poor lad like that? How dost you use the king's my father's meanest subject so? Open the gates and let him in. You should have seen that fickle crowd snatch off their hats then. You should have heard them cheer and shout. 
Long live the Prince of Wales. The soldiers presented arms with their halberds, opened the gates and presented again as the little Prince of Poverty passed in, in his fluttering rags, to join hands with the Prince of Limitless Plenty. Edward Tudor said, Thou lookest tired and hungry, thou hast been treated ill. Come with me. Half a dozen attendants sprang forward. I don't know what. Interfere? No doubt. But they were waved aside with a right royal gesture, and I stopped stuck, still where they were, like so many statues. Edward took Tom to a rich apartment in the palace, which he called his cabinet. By his command, a repast was brought such as Tom had never encountered before, except in books. The prince, with princely delicacy and breeding, sent away the servants so that his humble guests might not be embarrassed by their critical presence. Then he sat nearby and asked questions while Tom ate. What is thy name, lad? Tom Canty, and it pleased thee, sir. Tis an old one. Where dost live? In the city, please thee, sir. Awful court, out of the putting lane. Awful court? Truly tis an old one. Has parents? Parents have I, sir, and a grand dam likewise, that is but indifferently precious to me. God forgive me if it be offence to say it. Also twin sisters, Nan and Bat. Then is thy grandam not of a kind to thee, I take it? Neither to any other is she, so please your worship. She hath a wicked heart, and worketh evil all her days. Doth she mistreat thee? There be times that she stayed her hand, being asleep or overcome with drink, but when she hath her judgment clear again, she maketh up to me with goodly bettings. Fierce Luke came into the prince's eyes, and he cried out, What? Beatings? Oh, indeed, yes, please you, sir. Beatings? And thou so frail and little, hark ye, before the night come, she shall hie her to the tower, the king, my father. In sooth, you forget, sir, her low degree, the tower is for the great alone. True indeed. I had not thought of that. I will consider of her punishment. Is thy father kind to thee? Not more than Gamma Canty, sir. Fathers be alike, my hap. Mine had not a dull's temper. He smitted with a heavy hand, yet spared me. He spared me not always with his tongue, though, sooth to say. How doth thy mother use thee? She is good, sir and giveth me neither sorrow nor pain of any sort, and Nan and Beth are like to her in this. How old be this? Fifteen, and it please you, sir. The Lady Elizabeth, my sister, is fourteen, and the Lady Jane Grey, my cousin, is of mine own age, and comely and gracious withal. But my sister, the Lady Mary, with her gloomy mien, and, look you, do thy sisters forbid their servants to smile, lest the sin destroy their souls? They? Oh, those things, sir, uh, that they have servants? The little prince contemplated the little pauper gravely a moment, then said, And pretty, why not? Who helpeth them undress at night? Who tired them when they rise? None, sir. Wouldst have them take off their garment and sleep without, like the beasts? Their garment? Have they but one? Ah, good, you worship. What would they do with more? Truly, they have not two bodies each. It's a quiet and marvelous thought. Thy pardon, I had not meant to laugh. But thy good nan and thy bat shall have Raymond and Lake Snow, and that soon too. My coffer shall look into it. No, thank me not, there's nothing. Thou speakest well, thou hast an ease grace in it. Art learned? I know not if I am or not, sir. The good priest that is called Father Andrew taught me, of his kindness, from his books. Knowst thou the Latin? But scantly, sir, I doubt. 
Learn it, lad. Tis hard only at first. The Greek is harder, but neither these nor any tongues else, I think, are hard to the Lady Elizabeth and my cousin. Thou shouldst hear those damsels at it. But tell me of thy awful court. Hast thou a pleasant life there? In truth, yes. So please you, sir, save when one is hungry. There be punch and duty shows, and monkeys, O oh, such antique creatures, and so bravely dressed, and there be plays wherein they that play do shout and fight till all are slain, and tis so fine to see and coasted by the farting, albeit tis main hard to get the farting, please your worship. Tell me more. We, lads of awful court, do strife against each other with the cudgel, like to the fashion of the princess sometimes. The prince's eyes flashed. Said he, Mary, that would not I mislike. Tell me more. We strive in races, sir, to see who of us shall be fleetest. What would I like also? Speak on. In summer, sir, we wade and swim in the canals and in the river, and each dog duck in his neighbor, and splatter him with water, and dive and shout and tumble and... Thou wilt word my father's kingdom but to enjoy it once. Pretty go on. We dance and sing about the maypole in Chipside. We plains the sand, each covering his neighbor up. And times we make mud pastry. Oh, the lovely mud. It had not its like the delightfulness in all the world. We do fairly wallow in the mud, sir, saving your worship's presence. Oh, pretty, say no more, tis glorious. If that I could but clothe me in raiment like to thine, I strip my feet and revel in the mud once, just once, with none to rebuke me or forbid. Masmid, I could forego the crown. And if that I could clothe me once, sweet sir, and thou art clad, just once. Oh, ho, wouldst like it? Then, so shall it be. Doff thy racks and don these splendors, lad. It is a brief happiness, but we'll not be less keen for that. We will have it while we may, and change again before any come to molest. A few minutes later, the Prince of Wales was garlanded with Tom's fluttering goats and ants, and the little Prince of Popperdon was tricked out in the gaudy plumage of royalty. The two went and stood side by side before a great mirror, and... Lo, a miracle! There did not seem have been any change made. They stared at each other, then at the glass, then at each other again. At last the puzzled princeling said, What dost thou make of this? Ah, good your worship, require me not to answer. It is not meet that one of my degree should utter the thing. Then will I utter it. Thou hast the same hair, the same eyes, the same voice and manner, the same form and stature, the same face and countenance that I bear. Fared we forth naked, there is none could say which was you and which was the Prince of Wales. And now that I am clothed as thou wert clothed, it seemeth I should be able the more nearly to feel as thou didst when the brute soldier, hark ye, is not this bruise upon your hand? Yes, but it is a slight thing, and your worship knoweth that the poor man at arms. Peace, it was a shameful thing and a cruel, cried the little prince, stamping his bare foot. If the king stir not a step till I come again, it's a command. In a moment, he had snatched up and put away an article of national importance that lay upon the table and was out at the door and flying through the palace grounds in his banner drags with a hot face and glowing eyes. As soon as he reached the great gate, he seized the bars and tried to shake them, shouting, Open! Unbar the gates! The soldier that had maltreated Tom obeyed promptly, and as the prince burst through the portal, half smothered with the royal rat, the soldier fetched him a sounding box on the ear that sent him wheeling to the roadway and said, Take that, 
though beggars spawn for what thou gost me from his highness. The crowd roared with laughter. The prince picked himself out of the mud and made fiercely at the sentry, shouting, I am the prince of Wales, my person is sacred, and thou shalt hang for laying thy hand upon me. The soldier brought his halberd to the present arms and said mockingly, I salute your gracious highness. Then angrily, be off, thou crazy rubbish. Here the jeering crowd closed round the poor little prince and hustled him far down the road, hooting him and shouting, Way for his royal highness, way for the prince of Wales. <laughs>